What's up, everyone? Welcome to another episode of Not About Wrestling. I'm your host, Chris Luminati, and today I'm talking to journalist, lawyer, historian, and strength athlete, Oliver Bateman. Oliver has produced content for a wide range of publications, including Vice, Vox, The Atlantic, as well as wrestling-focused content for The Ringer. When he's not writing, Oliver is the co-host of the popular political podcast, What's Left? In this episode, Oliver and I discuss his early days as a wrestling fan, how he got involved in bodybuilding and powerlifting at a young age, the recent issues with wrestlers threatening to unionize, and his work on a cultural study about the hyper-real male bodies of the 20th century and their effects on the average guy like you and me. Oliver is incredibly articulate and well-read, and I really enjoy talking to him about the long-term mental effects that our gassed-up, greased-up wrestling heroes might have had on, on guys our age. So let's jump right into the conversation. Ladies and gentlemen, entering the podcast, originally hailing from Scenery Hill, Pennsylvania, this is Oliver Bateman. What's up, everybody? I'm here with Oliver Bateman on the Not About Wrestling podcast. Oliver, how are you, my friend? Doing all right. Doing all right. Good to be here, Chris. You know, you are my first nighttime interview. Okay, yeah. Nighttime's the right time yeah. during the day. <laughs> I'm wondering if it's going to give it like a little bit different of a vibe. Well, I, I mean, I may have to pause quickly if my, uh, my wife goes upstairs to uh, feed the baby, but I, I, think, uh, I think it'll be all right. Maybe, uh, maybe Cleo's asleep. How, how old's the baby? <laughs> Uh, she is nine months, a little over nine months. Oh, uh, congratulations. Yeah, yeah, great, great little one. But not a wrestling fan yet, but she does have a wrestling mat. So oh, nice. She, she's learning, you know, folk-style wrestling at nine oh. months. <laughs> so, so, so let me ask, um, the wrestling thing, uh, will you kind of expose her to it? Will you hope she picks up on it? Do you not care? It's already, I mean, wrestling and MMA are on while she's out in the playroom all day so i think all bets are off uh, she likes to fight she knows what that word means so okay <laughs> so I, I don't really I, I mean i'm not my parents didn't censor any i mean part of the reason i'm talking to you is because my parents didn't censor any of the content that i <laughs> consumed this is my dad was like yeah i'll get you these old ass wrestling magazines uh from the back pages you know because like in the after magazines you could order older after magazines you know yes. you could order the 70s and 80s copies He's like, you know, I'll buy these for you if it's all just nonsense. It's all just made up stories anyway. But like, he's like, I'll order these for you if you talk to me about them. I'll read them too. He's like, but you got to be able to talk to me about them. And that, that, so that was a good trade off. So I had to watch this stuff sometimes with him. And we would talk about the storylines or what it meant. Or was this guy a good speaker? I don't know why he wanted to do that, but he was really interested in participating with me like that. And the same with, with actual sports. You know, he wanted to be there to help me out with all that. Was your dad a was your dad a wrestling fan? No, no. I mean, he watched it grow up. He was a football fan, and he played college football at West Virginia, and like that was his that was sort of his big thing. But you know, where he watched the local wrestling here in Pittsburgh, uh, as everyone did at that time. Because if you've ever like talked to anybody, you know, who's like fifty or sixty years old, they all vaguely remember when the wrestling was on their affiliate station. Mm -hmm. they're like oh yeah i remember that wrestling or oh and then they'll know the local worker mm -hmm. like oh yeah yeah i remember so and so you know freddie blasty real big out here in la and that's like your hook to talk to them mm -hmm. i learned so he had that same kind of like he knew the guys that that would be on tv at, coming through the pittsburgh area and then he watched uh yeah, i mean he found it interesting you, you know he, he watched with me and my brother in the 80s so we would we would you know once or twice uh, throughout the late 80s, we would buy a pay-per-view. That was a hell of a process back in the day. Um, and again, we would, I'd have to sit there and talk to him the whole time, I'm like Did seven he, years old. He would, he would watch the pay-per-view with you? Yeah, yeah. He <laughs> thought it was dumb as hell. But he, he really enjoyed it at this. You know what I mean? Like, I think he just, it was a way for him to hang out with his kids. Uh -huh. and, uh, we, didn't, we didn't have many other times to hang out with him uh, because he's either working or, you know, upset about something. So it was kind of nice that, 
that was kind of a bond. So, I, you know, like my historical background and a lot of the stuff that I, I write about, like I, I just wrote a, a Tracy Smothers uh, obituary. And I remember Tracy Smothers not because of him as a worker in WCW. I remember him because my dad had just relocated us all to Eastern North Carolina and the kids in school watched WCW wrestling instead of WBF wrestling. Mm -hmm. And so I began watching and, you know, there you had these guys in like Confederate jackets coming out, right. uh, being from Southwestern Pennsylvania, moving to Eastern North Carolina. It was really damn interesting, you know, like, and so I remember Tracy's mothers through the lens of, I saw him, uh, and I saw Armstrong when I, when I was a kid, but it, you know what I mean? Like, I didn't think that years later I would be following them. And even when I'd see him pop up here or there, it never occurred to me that, that he was significant. But I remember like my first impressions of him were just like at stages in my life. And I think wrestling actually occurs to people like that. Like, oh, I remember I, I'm from, you know, so-and-so like uh, I'm from Florida and I remember Dusty Rhodes and Jack Briscoe coming through, you know what I mean? Like that mm -hmm. type of stuff. And so I've always found that's a it's a great way to like lead into conversations with people on top of everything else. Do you remember your first like watching wrestling memory? Like what kind of hooked you? God, it was the you know it was definitely the AM like WWF stuff, mm -hmm. uh, which led to Saturday watching some of the like Saturday night's main events that posted on NBC or that, that ran on NBC when SNL wasn't on. Mm -hmm. I remember that pretty clearly. I would say my clearest and most distinct memory of wrestling early on is being able to point out that Jesse Ventura was in The Running Man and Predator, <laughs> but was also the commentator for WBF programming. And I was like, that's pretty cool. I like him. You know what I mean? Like that, right. that's, I think that's my clearest and most distinct memory just because he had such a memorable voice. He had such a memorable presentation mm -hmm. and it, it's things like that. I mean, you know, I, I might remember him like flexing even when he would sort of buff down, he wasn't on steroids after he had some kind of like heart incident or something in the ring. Mm -hmm. uh, and he wasn't that big. He was a big guy, tall guy, but he wasn't like Jack. And I just remember I might, I might he, he was still the body, which I also found funny. <laughs> and I was like, that's, that's interesting. You know, so it's, it's memories like that. I mean, I think the first match I really recall, like really vividly, uh, the double count out with Billy Jack Haynes and Hercules Hernandez at WrestleMania three mm -hmm. and the Adrian Adonis Piper match there because Adrian Adonis did a good corner bump. Uh, he's real fat at the time. And I thought that was interesting mm -hmm. that he could move pretty well for being that fat. Um, I just think, you know what I mean? Like, it was just interesting to me. Uh, you know, it's, it's an athletic match, kind of a funny match. And, you know, Steamboat, Steamboat Savage was on that pay-per-view, mm -hmm. but I, you know, like that match, I, I know it, I, I remember it more. There was some like George the Animal Steel interference in it. Mm -hmm. I remember that more because that guy was covered in like a pelt of hair. Mm -hmm. Right. And I remember him losing or not. I think he had a, I think he had a count out at WrestleMania two or something, or he got DQ'd somehow. I definitely remember Adrian Adonis beating Uncle Elmer at WrestleMania too, as mm -hmm. well, in like a really boring, bad match. But it was a great match because Uncle Elmer, Plowboy Frazier, was so big, mm -hmm. and Adrian Adonis was had really gotten heavy at that time. And for some reason, I was just like really, just really stuck in the mind. I was like, that's kind of, and that, that's a lot. That's how I've, I've thought about a lot of this, like just kind of these impressions that stick, and I, mm -hmm. I think about them, you know. One of my um, biggest impressions, and, uh, you know, they uh, I mean, I watched before this happened, but the one thing that sticks out in my head of when wrestling really had a true effect on me, and it keeps on coming back up because with The Undertaker retiring now or retiring, whatever he's doing. Yeah. Um, do you remember when The Undertaker locked The Ultimate Warrior in the casket? Yes. Yeah. And that was during an, uh, that was during an under un Ultimate Warrior comeback, right? He hadn't had he left and come back or was he, was that I, at the end of his first run? I feel like that was maybe at the end of his first run because so the Undertaker debuted around 90. I feel like this might've been 91. So why, why it's so yeah. memorable, memorable to me was, so uh, Ultimate Warrior is one of my favorites. They lock him in the casket. They open the casket up. He's ripping to get out. He can't get out. That night I go to my very first viewing as a huh. Huh. 
And so I'm looking at this body in the coffin. Impression, yeah. Yeah, I, I did not sleep that night at all. Like not what I remember, vividly remember watching the sun rise because I did not sleep hmm. the entire night. And that's when I think wrestling, I realized had such a profound effect on me as a kid. Yeah, the images are, are really like really striking and we're, we're drawn to them for, for different reasons. I, I remember that uh, I, they were there, there was always something like, like when Don Morocco and Dino Bravo had a brief feud, I remember that being big just because, you know, my brother was a really accomplished athlete and he was a very strong kid at that time. And he watched the sport. We would talk about how big, you know, like these dudes are huge, you know, they're obviously they're pumped full of uh, Diana ball and other substances, but like they're, they're huge. And so that would always be vivid. And my dad was, you know, at different points, 400 pounds, 350 pounds, but he was still very athletic and fat. But, uh, and so those things for the same reason, like I, I was just sort of drawn to those images in the ring, I guess, because I saw something there that, that, that resonated me with daily, daily life. I mean, uh, and that, that, that's what struck me. Like these guys were doing a physical job. Their physicality was, was interesting. And uh, for whatever reason, the, the impressions were left there, but like the casket, for example, that's a really striking thing because you're going directly from, from one to the other. Yes. You know, and I mean, to, to me, like by 91 and then like the cat being put in the casket was like a recurring undertaker thing. And I found it cool, but it wouldn't have, it wouldn't have hit me at that, that age. Like I found it cool. It was like, car, you know, not car, kind of cartoonish, colorful, yeah. but it wouldn't, it wouldn't have, it wouldn't have struck me because it wasn't tied to something like that. You know, yeah. I think it was because that night I saw my first dead body. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, yeah, yeah. The same day. One to one connection. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and to that day, like, it's really kind of like stuck with me and I think about it often. But something you mentioned before about the bodies that I, I wanted to talk to you about, it's actually kind of a good segue. So I noticed on your website, uh, you said that you're currently working on cultural studies monograph about hyper real male bodies of the 20th yeah. century. Let's talk about that. What, what is that? Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's something that, that hopefully like the first version of this book proposal that my agent shopped around kind of died. I think this was 2016 or 17. Uh, I have gone on to write dozens more pieces for different publications, be it the Paris Review, the Ringer, a lot of the Ringer essays I do um, touch on this. Uh, a lot of things that I write elsewhere deal with that. And, and it's just sort of me like reckoning with or, or interpreting or, or trying to come to terms or trying to understand these impressions I have of these, these different, uh, these differently shaped, differently uh, built performers during this period. I, I think that like, in fact, David Shoemaker at the ringer and I have talked about, uh, I think maybe two months ago was the last time we mentioned it, he brought it up, but we talked about a series where I would start branching out from like wrestling bodybuilding type bodies into maybe like writing about Clint Eastwood or something or writing about, you know, some other memorable body from, from that period, you know, Sean Connery died and that could have been a good hook, but I didn't think that to write about, or even to ask to write about Connery. But I, I think the story is sort of, the story there is sort of like my own kind of journey through all that uh, while reflecting on like how I saw these people, how they sort of were situated historically, you know, because like fitness, what powerlifting, bodybuilding has been a big part of my life too. It's been an interesting part of my life. Studying that community has been an interesting part of my part of my life. And the first go round of the book, the first proposal we shopped to different uh, publishing houses, I think was just too saturated with buzzwords. Like I, I put things in there that that I just thought people were interested in at the time toxic masculinity and stuff you know buzzwords that were big 2016 2017 right and I, I don't think that they need to be addressed that way like i think that there's a way that the, the narrative can can pay it forward and pay it off without you know just hitting on like stuff that sounds like it's hot take or something mm -hmm. so the revised version is just me doing more and better essays to build i mean there's 150,000 words like sitting out there but they got to come together into something that has something that's linking it from chapter to chapter. But when it's done, it's going to be, it's going to be good. I mean, this is, this is the, my like life's work. This is my project. 
And whether, you know, like the fitness piece of it, I've, I've done about 60, 65 articles for Dollar Shave Clubs, Mail Magazine. Mm-hmm. Most, there's wrestling pieces there, but most of those are bodybuilding and, uh, and fit, bodybuilding fitness bodies. I'm actually doing a piece, like finishing it up tonight on uh, a new comic book that's coming out called uh, Beef Brothers. It's about two beefy men who uh, are kind of like, uh, sort of like leftist superheroes for the, the 21st century. And, you know, they, the writer, Aubrey Sitterson, is a, uh, a friend of mine. I know Aubrey. Yeah, yeah, he, yeah. he wrote the comic book History of Pro Wrestling, mm-hmm. which is a good, a good hundred page, uh, like succinct, well done. Uh, him and the illustrator, I think Chris Moreno, well done little book for anybody that wants uh, an overview. I'll give it a give it a plug because I mean, it's it's legit. But I'm writing about that and sort of how he how he and his uh, the artist that he you know co created it with how they uh, what they you know how they were exposed to like muscle bodies in the comics of the 80s and so on and and you just kind of putting that together. So there's a whole like body of other stuff that I've done so to speak that that touches on that side of things mm-hmm. and with the ringer it's been a lot of like wrestling obituaries thematic historical wrestling pieces I'm pushing it pushing it together you know I, I think that there's it's a book that can come out of all that because that's how a lot of books get done mm-hmm. you know published pieces come together and they uh, with some new material and material linking it together and there's the book I just don't have that linking material yet I don't have that through line yet but I think at some point I'll, I'll I'll step back from like I work a day job you know I work uh um I I've got another podcast that I do I, I do a lot of writing on the side I just haven't stepped back from the like hustle to really to really work on that but that's going to be a hell of a hell of a thing when it gets done because I put I'd say probably 75 50 to 75 percent of the writing I've done over the past two years is basically for that, and it's going to help the book. Well, well, one of the reasons I bring it up is because, and didn't this didn't dawn on me until maybe a year or two ago, that <clears throat> growing up, a lot of the personal issues that I have, or a lot of the way that I saw myself and my body, mm-hmm. was reflected on watching professional wrestling and the guys I saw in professional wrestling. So my kind of like golden era of wrestling is mid eighties to late Mm nineties. And if you look at the guys that dominated at that time, you know, ultimate warrior, Rick rude, these guys with these like larger than life bodies kind of that no regular guy could really attain unless, you know, dedication, but you look at them as a kid and you're like, I got to look like that. That And of course, you know, there's the influence of like, I, I got muscle and fitness. I read men's health. I yeah, saw yeah. people on built, but, and what, what actually the, the three things that kind of made it pop out were one that all my favorite performers were always the chiseled guy. Number yeah. One. Yeah. That's what you wanted to see in the ring. Right. right. N- number two, one of my favorite gifts as a kid was I got the Hulk Hogan workout set, <laughs> which had the hand grippers and the weights and the, like, I was going to be just like the Hulkster. I was going to look just like the Hulkster brother now. And then I looked at a lot of, and it, And until I put them all together and saw them, I saw a lot of pictures of myself as a kid and my kind of go-to pose was flexing. And I wasn't even really, there was nothing to flex. It's just me doing this because that's what all my heroes did. They went like this, they went like this. So I thought when a camera's on, this is what I had to do. I mean, there's one picture of me. I might even put it in this blog at some point where it's like, I'm sitting on my aunt's rocking chair in her room. And like, I'm not even trying, I'm just like, like, I don't even want to be in the picture, but I felt the need to do this. And yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. Kids of the 80s really struck muscle poses. Mm-hmm. Uh, they wore muscle shirts. They wore neon colored shirts. Some of them wore spandex. It was, they wore wraparound shades. Very strange. And, mm-hmm. and they're at like the, like the actual way that they like performed in their bodies was very much. Uh, there's a ton of photos of me doing that too, you know, like a ton of photos of me, a ton of photos of my brother, all popping uh, poses that, that are most likely just derived from, from pro wrestling, which is deriving it from body. You know? Right. Like, but it's not coming from bodybuilding directly, even though we did, you know, we, we knew, you know, we knew Lee Haney, we knew vaguely what was going on in that sport, but it was filtered through pro wrestling, pro wrestling brought in that bodybuilding style, but 
the guys were different. They chiseled too. Like they were puffy, uh, mm-hmm. puffy chiseled a lot of them, you know, like Dino Bravo, puffy and chiseled. And if you look back at like the legs on a lot of those guys, uh, with a few exceptions, pretty, uh, it's all upper body heavy, you yeah. know? If you go back in and like look at the legs and the trunks and, and some of these guys, it's, it's clear they're not, uh, they're, they're skipping leg day in a lot of yeah. cases. But the upper torsos, now they, they, again, there's a few guys that have like gigantic legs. Uh, Ted Arcidi wrote yeah. an essay about him in the 80s aesthetic that's on uh, Splice today. Ted Arcidi was sort of like who I saw and I was like, I've got to be that big, mm-hmm. you know? He's like 5, 10, 350, uh-huh. benching 700 pounds or something, you know, at that time. Like a powerlifting world champ, they tried to turn into a wrestler, and it just didn't didn't work out. But I I I like that. I, I and you know I also wrote an essay about Rick Rude. Different set of things. Like why was Rick Rude hated by all of the women in the crowd? Mm-hmm. Because you know Rick Rude would come out. Uh, David Shoemaker has a good essay about that that too. But like why would Rick Rude come out and be immediately booed by everyone, despite supposedly being this like object of tremendous sex appeal? Mm-hmm. You know, even has his opponent on his tr- on his uh, tights half the time, uh, and they all like no one finds him attractive in in the audience. You know, he calls them mm-hmm. sweat hogs and pigs, and that's it's great stuff. Scott Steiner would do it later in his career too. You know, that was pretty funny. Mm-hmm. But why why would you know what I mean? Like all of this, all of this was odd. Like there was no other cultural niche. Like 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 you sort of noted, there's no other like thing where I experienced this type of culture at all. Like that, this was not what the other, like the adults did. This was not, if kids didn't watch wrestling, they weren't like this, you know? Mm-hmm. So it was very much this, this like little uh, sort of lived in world, you know, it was very strange. I, I've, I found Rick Rude fascinating too. One of the things about him has always been, so if you take the great guy in shape, the white meat baby mm-hmm. face, they're always a good looking guy, but they have the baby face. Yes. Whereas true, Rick Rude, true. Rick Rude was incredibly chiseled, but he looks like he would beat the shit out of you in any situation. And he's a mean man. He's a mean yeah. looking man. He looks yeah. very mean. The porn star mustache, like yep. it looks like he's going to crack you in the face if he wants. And he got better and better on the mic at conveying that too throughout his career. By the time he's in WCW, he was, he was exceptional uh, yeah. at it. But yeah, yeah, he was not. If you so, if you had that look, you just couldn't be. You couldn't be a, a baby face, and like. In the WCW product, a lot of the baby faces going into the 90s were still kind of like chubby Southern guys with mullets, mm-hmm. you know, like a blonde mullet, kind of a pretty face, puffy, not, not you know, conditioned, but not like super buff, uh, maybe even a gut. Mm-hmm. And uh, the women would be going wild for these guys, you know. Mm-hmm. The Rock and Roll Express would be just, yeah. uh, one of the guys has almost like a, uh, you know, Gibson has almost like a, uh, I think a, uh, freaking lazy eye or something and they're just the crowd is just uh in in rapture over there yeah. which is pretty amazing like that's it's, its own thing but it's really interesting w- one of my favorite is uh the jim Cornette quote that the rock and roll express got laid more on the way to the ring than he did his entire life <laughs> <laughs> but like and those two guys like yes. if you rolled yeah. them out today there's no venue yeah I mean, then they they still roll out today. You yeah, know? they do. Like, like yeah. you know, and I God bless them. They're not using any steroids or anything to look young. They're mm-hmm. definitely not trying to look young. <laughs> but they just look like you couldn't roll two guys out today who look like that. They could maybe be comedy mm-hmm. wrestlers, but nobody. The crowd would not be like, ah, oh, these these are the hottest guys. But it's amazing mm-hmm. for that time and place. That is really like you know Jim Cornette's mind is stuck there in mm-hmm. a way. Yeah. Like for him, that's the big time, you know, yeah. like it's not selling out Madison Square Garden. It's selling out the Greensboro Coliseum, yeah. you know, or the Mid-South Arena or something like that. That's that's the big time. And actually, you know, growing up a month, when we moved to Eastern North Carolina. There were people who were provincial enough that that like something big happening in New York was irrelevant. But something big happening in like Raleigh, North Carolina was that was huge. Yeah. And yeah. like I, I kind of, love, you know, you kind of miss that in a way. Jim, yeah. Jim Cornette keeps, he's, he's part of the, he's still part of the mainstream, but he's, his analysis is very much like, it was really good from 1984 to 1989, mm-hmm. you know, with a few ups and downs in there. It was really a good time. What, it, what kind of amazes me about Cornette is the, what, his thought process on wrestling. You would think if you took that and made it in everyday life, you'd think he'd be very much right. 
but he's not. He's very much left, which does not make any sense for where he grew up, how he grew up, what business he was in. And it amazes me that he's completely the opposite. He is as strong on uh, like getting Trump out of office as like MSNBC or James Carville. Yeah. The show, like those references abound in there and it is very clear. Yeah, no, in a way, I mean, it's hard to say exactly how, like, is it like the vestiges of like Southern being a Southern Democrat and just kind of coming out of that era is the fact that he's, you know, somewhat, he's a sharp guy. I mean, well, it's hard to say, but he is, anyone listening to that show gets a heavy dose of, I'm so glad we got Trump out of there or I hate Trump or mm. that, that's been a big part of his presentation for a while. It is really strange. Right. I mean, I, I would, I would either expect him to have no opinion about it mm-hmm. or I would expect him to have maybe a more conservative opinion or something, but no, no, he's, he's like Rachel Maddow, uh, except, you know, at least on this one issue. Yeah, that that always amazed me. Um, Getting back to the body thing. So we were talking about how like you couldn't roll out a rock and roll express today. (laughs) Like, but so that's kind of a knock on on a lot of the guys today from the older guys saying like, you know, when they walk into a locker room, everybody pretty much looks the same. Like everybody's pretty much interchangeable. Whereas, you know, back in the day, everybody looked different with the exception of a couple, like, you know, maybe a Kevin Owens Bray Keith Wyatt Lee. when he doesn't have all the thing on like Keith everyone's Lee. kind of Keith Lee is an amazing looking Keith Lee character right but Keith Lee still I mean Keith Lee is like the one man gang of this era like he's still yeah. a giant guy so he doesn't need to be but I mean like everybody if you look they're yeah. like six pack ripped kind of so do you, do you think like guys think I pretty much am not going to make it unless I have that look it is weird. It's almost like a continuum from like the Miz to Zolf Ziggler to like Zach Wilde or somebody to finally to Brian Cage. Mm-hmm. You know, like you go down this continuum, but it's all a variation on this body. And they're all fairly athletic relative to like, like, like Brian Cage is a lot more athletic than Dino Bravo. Mm-hmm. You know, he's so it is strange. So even within that variability of body, they all can kind of do things. Kevin Owens is an interesting example. I thought he was actually getting more in shape for a while, but he always, he's still kind of the same shape. He's a little fitter than he was uh, in the Indies, yeah. but he's still kind of the same shape. The only interesting one, and I just kept wondering about it for years and years, was uh, Chris Hero, Cassius Ono. Because mm-hmm. I'd see him, you know, I'd see him at shows and stuff. He, he is a, a throwback in many different ways. He's just kind of heavy set. Mm-hmm. And they kept putting him in tight apparel. Mm-hmm. Like he was tucking his basketball jersey into his into his tights at one point, mm-hmm. uh, and I was like, "This is, I mean, but other than someone like that who could wrestle, he was, but he also had a full move set. Mm-hmm. Like he he had the the weird shape, but he had this full move set. So yeah, I, I think it is uniform. You're not going to find like a cinder block King Kong Bundy looking guy just wandering in. Uh, right. Yeah, there's there's not as much of that, and if they are, they have a short run. Like sometimes monsters go through the WWE, but they, you know, there's not like another Undertaker sticking. And even he was a change. Like he was the athletic right. monster that was just going to be there forever. And then Kane was a 2.0 of that. And they, you know, they've, 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 the standards have changed. Yeah. I mean, like everybody, a lot of the training is the same. A lot of these guys, uh, you know, they're a lot fitter standards are better, but yeah, I mean, if you're looking for that kind of, that kind of novelty, I guess it is, especially like take like NXT, you know, where the, the wrestling is very athletic and hard hitting. So everybody is like 205 pounds and looks like Finn Balor. Mm-hmm. Right. Some, some, some version of that. You know what I mean? Like, right. you know, some are a little more ripped, some are a little less ripped, but they're all good. They're all good workers. Mm-hmm. You know, I guess, I guess Walter kind of stands out. Um, uh, but, but he's kind of another, except again, he can do the full complement of moves as well so right. it is it is an unusual time like you're not finding too many vaders you're not finding too many stan hansons there's definitely no more like visceras visceras or uh haystacks calhouns or these like 600 pound i mean is there anybody right now who's like 600 pounds or 500 pounds wrestling as a uh, real attraction a real big uh, not that i can think of the only guy so he's not 600 pounds but the only guy that breaks every mold of professional wrestling when you think of a look has to be otis 
Yeah, yeah, no, I remember he, him for the ringer, but he's yeah, but he's maybe 300, 200. No, but I mean like he fit like he he's not is, that tall, yeah. he's not that tall, he's not that jacked, yep. he's not I mean he's incredibly athletic and yeah. has like the yeah. the lifting background. Yeah. But like when you look at him, you don't like No. You know, he's not the guy they always say that like a lot of the professional wrestlers, if you see them walking through an airport, you look at them and go, I don't know who that guy is, but that guy is somebody. If Otis is walking through an airport, yeah. you're going to think he works there or you're going to think that he's just another maintenance person. He doesn't fit the WWE mold, yet he did make it. I mean, because yeah. of his ability and his like on camera persona. Yeah, he 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 is a testament to uh, to just uh, somehow like again. I, w- I was hoping that there'd be you know an even bigger push in store for him after Money in the Bank. I kind of knew that uh, he has he has a ceiling, but the fact that he got where he is is pretty pretty crazy. Tucker too. Uh, mm. I mean. Now, and like they, they like the WWE clearly recognized that and played them up. They stopped wrestling in singlets. They started wrestling in tights, you know, mm-hmm. like it was like, it was a, a novelty, but they, but again, they're so much more athletic than your typical worker of the eighties. Like somebody who yes. looked jacked, yeah. Otis could run rings around him. Keith Lee could run rings around him. And that's, that's interesting too. People are just fitter in there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of the, a lot of it has to do with, in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, when you became a professional wrestler, it was kind of like, because you didn't want to be a bouncer anymore. You didn't want to be, you know, whatever yeah, you are. Yeah. But now it's like, okay, all these guys with athletic backgrounds, they know as a kid, but then I want to be a wrestler. Like there's a, you know. It's a continuation. They view, yes. They're going to keep training. Like I didn't make the NFL or I was in there for a year, but now I'm going to do this and I'll, I'll yeah. keep training hard and I'll train for the sport. Whereas like, you know, 60s, 70s, maybe you wash out of the NFL, but you end up in pro, like, you know, you're a territorial star and you're like, shit, I don't have to work out hard anymore. Mm-hmm. I'm just going to make 250 bucks uh, a night or a week or whatever, yeah. depending on where I'm at in the car. And I'm going to, I'm going to work 300 days a year and just kind of drive around in a car and eat bologna and mm-hmm. drink beer. <laughs> and that's, yeah. that's fun. Uh, yeah. But yeah, there's like, that definitely, and like, that was like such a novelty in the 80s and all the interviews, people were like, Ric Flair would hit the Stairmaster for two hours. And that was genuinely a novelty. Yeah, yeah. He was like really working out. But then, yeah, I mean, but then, yeah. but then, but then you hear the next story where like he was drunk right before yeah. bell time. And like, yeah. all right, well. So he still wasn't perfectly conditioned. Uh-huh. No, you know, he quite. was he was getting there. He at least understood you had to you had to like walk up uh, steps to, to be able to put on a 50 minute match, yeah. but it got, it got better. And it has gotten better and better. Like the ultimate warrior looks to the like lay person much fitter than Otis. Yeah. But I mean, I would pick Otis in a foot race. I would pick oh, him yeah. in a wrestling match. Cause that's his real background. I would yeah. pick him in, you know, a lifting event. I'd pick him in almost anything. And it's just funny. Like, mm-hmm. Because again, the ultimate warrior to me was like the personification of like, he's perfect. You know, he's yeah. the only man that can beat Hulk Hogan because of how muscular he is. Yeah. Nope. No. Nope. But I, <laughs> I, it is, it is really striking, like very similar guys with a few exceptions, but even when the guys are exceptions, they can wrestle and they can have these aggressive matches. Jim Cornette is kind of neutral on whether that's like, good or bad like a lot of spot like a lot of safe, safe spots but like a lot of spots a lot of athleticism mm-hmm. I, I think jim still has like a fondness for the rest hold mm-hmm. you know telling a story with 30 <laughs> minutes of rest holds oh we could just work a headlock in biloxi yeah, you know i don't i don't know with guys like him i don't know if it's so much the rest hold i, I here's where i do agree with them when you're starting a match off let's say you're going 15 minutes when you're starting a match off and in the first five minutes you have so many high spots where do you go from there? Like you can't build down, you know, you can't, you got to like, so they have to up like a couple, a lot of the things that they, especially the AEW guys, the things they do now and everything is now moved to like the edge of the apron, like almost on the outside. Like it just watching it. I go, Oh Jesus. Like I'm, I'm afraid to watch. That's a really popular type of spot that you almost, it feels, it feels obligatory. Yeah. You, but you have the whole ring. Like, where are you going? Yeah. I wouldn't do this in the ring. I'd want to keep it towards the center of the ring, you know, like, like me and you know what I mean? Like you you don't want them to crawl out of the ring. And if you're a good wrestler, you take them down, you know, they stay, you want them in the center. Yeah. You don't, you don't want them to crawl up the ropes like they crawl. Like, but and the, the apron makes no sense. Yeah. That is true. I mean, for some of the like expected spots, 
there isn't a logical way to get to them. Like Ricochet, right. great wrestler. Right. There isn't a logical way to segue into a lot of what Ricochet does, but yeah. it's incredible. Mm-hmm. You, you know, like, yeah. you, you, but he doesn't, does it tell a story? And I know that's a big point for them, but probably not. But it does feel like it's required. Like you're going through training at the performance center and they're like, well, we got to have apron power bombs. We got to have, you know, uh, we got to have bunches of you got you got to be springboarding the ropes constantly mm-hmm. all of this sort of stuff you know like that that to me is yeah. I, I guess the fans want it i mean i guess somebody somewhere like and this is what some a friend of mine that 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 writes about like wrestling and theater was like the fans have just come to accept that this stuff is part of the theatrical performance of wrestling now mm-hmm. so you give it to them regardless of whether it serves a story purpose, you know, like the fans, like, well, it's this guy. He always does this move. Well, it's going in there, you know, like it's just going in there. It's kind of Ric Flair esque. Ric Flair really pioneered doing his same, Mm -hmm. uh, his same bumps Mm -hmm. in the match. Then Mm -hmm. Bret Hart to an extent, although his moves were super crisp, Bret Hart pioneered doing his same moves in a different sequence right. in every match. Like, so it would be kind of a novel match, really crisp stuff, but it was always the same moves, double, you know, second rope, uh, second rope elbow drop and all, all of this stuff look great. But now we have guys who it's clear you go see them like at the NXT touring show or something and their routine is set. They come yes. out and I, I'm disappointed if I don't see X, Y, Z, like I want right. them to be, but it doesn't, it doesn't make sense narratively. It only makes sense in the sense of like, you know, this wrestler and you're like, well, he always does the pop-up power bomb on the apron for some reason mm-hmm. he's got, it's got to come in here. So this guy's just going to stumble onto the apron mm-hmm. and we got to make that happen. Yeah. I think a lot of it is the uh, idea like, you know, when you go see your favorite band and they don't play the hits. Yeah. Yeah. So if you don't go see wrestlers are like, if I go see a guy and he doesn't play my hits, I'm going to be pissed. And guys realize that. And women realize that, that people are coming out to see them. And if they don't see the things they want to see, it's like, Oh, he had a terrible match because you didn't do the spots that you wanted, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I don't, I only want to see like with the old wrestlers, it's very clear. Like, Oh, you know, they brought Bob Backlund in at some indie show that I, I saw here in Pittsburgh. And he didn't do any moves. He stood on his head, which was kind of cool. <laughs> and he put somebody in the, the cross face. Uh-huh. And I wanted to see that. So I was like, okay, check. Uh-huh. I and saw it. I saw the hell out of it. Yeah. Uh, like I remember back, uh, you know, there was an event uh, when I was in grad school, like that they paid $500 for the lead singer of, I think the Verve, not the Verve pipe. It was the one that did the song like Freshman. Yeah, Verve, uh, there was, yeah. yeah, yeah, the Verve. And it was Brian Vander Ark. And he came up to, you know, this town in Northwest Indiana and all like all through his performance they just they just yelled at him these students to keep playing that song over and over again because no one wanted to hear any other material mm-hmm. and it was like you know, it was like we paid him to be here and now they're just going to yell at him to do the freshman song to do the uh, freshman yeah. well he's got to be used to that <laughs> yeah, and i think he was no, they're he not played, yelling anything else <laughs> yeah, they played it he played it like five times i mean yeah. stopping baby's breath with a shoe full of rice or whatever <laughs> yeah. the, the lyric goes it's burned in my head as a result of that uh, and so, I, I mean, like with the older guys, especially if I don't get the DDT out of a guy who that's his finisher, well, yeah. so like I'm, I'm going to go home. Uh, but, yeah. but for the younger guys, shit, they might have 12, 15, 20 Cesaro. Like there's going to be probably 15, 20 things I want to see out of him. Yeah. You know what they don't do anymore? And I wish somebody would bring it back just once. Just give me, just give me the old test of strength. Just put the hand That's up, a great time killer. Bring it back and just bring it around and just got, and then put it all the way down to the mat and just stomp it. <laughs> I mean, like Jesse Ventura tells a story about how like he improved as a performer because Vern Gagne had basically spent 10 minutes booking the show and he's like, okay, bruisers going over. I'm going over, uh, you know, uh, my son's going over and Ventura, you're going to be in the opening thing. You got to kill 30 minutes with an arm wrestling match, some mic work (laughs) and then the match and, you know, Ventura couldn't go 10 minutes, uh, Mm -hmm. but he could fill the, like the arm wrestling match could give you 15 minutes. The talking could give you 10 or 15 minutes. And then you could do a test of strength in the mm-hmm. ring or a bear mm-hmm. hug. Mm-hmm. And that would kill another five or 10. And then you would get disqualified. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that was the whole thing. So like that, that to me is a great use of time. I don't, I don't, it's not as popular. I haven't seen a bench press contest uh, in wrestling in a those. long time. Yeah. <laughs> Last one I remember is Ryback uh, and Mark Henry who were doing like, 
bench press reps 225 to simulate the nfl combine uh-huh. uh and, and then you know it ended in a fist fight or something like that like they're supposed to but before that i don't remember too many more uh i think that like scott steiner and triple h were supposed to have one when they were feuding and triple h cut a great promo about how wrestling wasn't about posing or bench presses or any of these things but looking back on it i'm like no no, it really was. <laughs> yes. I, I wrote an article about like how the pose that for Mel Magazine, about how like the pose down when Bobby Lashley started posing again, mm-hmm. when he had uh, Rush as his hype man. Yeah. I was like, oh, they're bringing the posing back. They bring the bench press contest back too. bring the test of strength back because yeah. that does kill airtime in a way that, you know, I'd rather watch that than like, you know, like a romantic angle. I'd rather watch 40 minutes yes. of, because yeah. that, that to me, is at least something that might happen in a real sport, you know, mm-hmm. who's stronger. You know, was a, a segment just like that that killed a ton of time because I recently watched it. The, the, the Dino Bravo bench press with Ooh. Jesse Ventura spotting yeah. him. Yeah, yeah, the like, fingers. I mean, they, yeah. they went up in five minute increments. Yeah. It was a good 20 minute segment. <laughs> that's how, that's that's the one everybody remembers. And that was sort of the, that was sort of the combination and the culmination of yeah. all the great bench press contests going into this just nonsensical thing like the form's bad the weight's gimmick ventura uh, over spots it's perfect yeah. everything about it is perfect dino bravo is doing a world's strongest man gimmick for some reason despite <laughs> yeah. many other wrestlers being larger than him including hulk hogan by a, a good deal and, and, and the warrior and everybody else yeah. um it's heat. One, that's why it's heat <laughs> the one thing i will say that i did not realize about dino bravo till my my friend ian douglas who who does a lot of these uh wrestling autobiographies like he co-authors them mm-hmm. uh he told me he was like go in and watch dino bravo wrestling jobbers on youtube because dino bravo would make a point of using other people's finishers while he just hurled the jobbers around the ring wow. so he not only treated them like mm-hmm. garbage he would do three or four other people's finishers in the midst of brutalizing them to just ruin the move because, you know, he was a kind of a jerk. And that was like, you know, like French Canadian, like they have a real rough sense of humor. So he just, yeah. he just loved to do it. You wouldn't find work today if you did that. No. If a guy did that today, like he'd be quartered out so hard. It's like, a great, it's a great. Going- no, because you, and you wouldn't abuse jobbers like that today either. Like right. it's, it's just a sign of how like unimportant the enhancement matches were that mm. he could come out and do that. And I'm sure he was probably going back and like high fiving with Pat Patterson after just, you know, tearing up some guy getting 50 bucks mm. uh, to just lay down. Uh, and that, that, that you don't get that today. That's an interesting regional uh, variation. There are a couple of guys who are notable for just obliterating jobbers. The Road Warriors did it as part of their gimmick. Mm-hmm. Scott and Rick Steiner mm-hmm. are on a bunch of lists as just jobber abusers, enhancement talent abusers. They have some great stuff on YouTube of just dropping guys on their heads. There, there's that one where that one guy went into business for himself. I think it was against the skyscrapers. Yeah, that's a great, oh, I think Cornette God. narrates that. Cornette yeah. narrates that. Anybody <laughs> has to watch that should watch that. It's amazing. Yeah, well, yeah, that guy's sold nothing sold nothing like even the finish he got up like there was a three and he like popped up and they just started beating the yeah. shit out of him and it's it like, wasn't what? clear if he, he knew or if because he was just he was just absorbing a beating yeah. there at the end yeah. that, that whole series that Cornette narrated uh with all the jobbers who are like screwing up somehow like guys who were overselling there's one he narrates where I think it's against like Rip Hawk or something mm-hmm. like that, where the jobber is like exaggeratedly falling down like a wet noodle <laughs> to everything that Rip Hawk does. Taps him and the guy like shakes and falls <laughs> to the ground. I haven't seen that one. I got to find <laughs> he that. Falls back many, many feet. Uh, it's like what it's like what Shawn Michaels did to Hulk Hogan in that match, but it, but even worse. Yeah. Uh, but you so can look, you can watch that now with some appreciation. Yeah. I, you can watch any of this stuff now and appreciate it either because it's not going to happen again or just because it happened at all you're like wow that's, that's really something yeah uh, all the enhancement guys who have become immortalized for, for either getting just obliterated or <laughs> being terrible <laughs> yeah. you know they're in the memory they're in the record books you know mm. so yeah. I, I i i love it yeah but uh before i let you go one thing i wanted to uh, talk about touch on because i feel like with your background you could lend a lot to this subject. The entire like union, uh, Zelina Vega thing with, you know, not being able third party stuff. Like 
how do you it's i feel like there's going to be a fight like this could go not the a, wwe's way i did a big analysis of it on my my own podcast what's left uh yeah. that's it's behind the paywall so i'll summarize because i was talking to jonathan snowden and yeah just kind of back and forth on twitter and a few other folks because you know whenever somebody talks union it gets real ex- people get real excited they want to do a whole bunch of stories um, I have always, other than a thing I did uh, in Al Jazeera back in 2014 that wasn't really about unionization, I've always steered clear of it just because, I number one, I can't think of a harder industry to unionize, mm-hmm. like, partly because it's hard to identify who the pool of workers are, partly it's because there ultimately are so few workers, mm-hmm. like, if you look at, like, gainfully employed workers across the mid-major and the major promotions in other countries, I would bet it's not more than a thousand people in the whole world, if that, 500 to a thousand. And the challenges in terms of, of like, there's not as much revenue to share, certainly in these like, like AEW. I mean, who knows how much revenue AEW even has to share at this point? WWE is nowhere near the pie that the NFL or MLB does. Uh, some of the people are themselves like, going to they're going to bucket like historically whenever there's been an attempt to form a wrestling union in the 50s and the 70s and the 80s with ventura trying to organize somebody rats them out anyway mm-hmm. like usually one of the higher it's a very cutthroat group and usually you you talk union when either you've been cut by an organization i mean ventura is an exception because he stayed on and sued the wwe and you know he got his through royalty monies from being on the Coliseum home video tapes. But in terms of, in terms of like actually creating a class, you know, going through the National Labor Relations Board, getting a union, I think it would be easier to organize Grubhub or like Lyft or Uber. And their unions are trying mm-hmm. uh, as well because those workers are at least connected. They're all in the app and so on. Um, I think pro wrestling what I, what I honestly think is going to happen here is the WWE, WWE is not stupid. I, I think that it is going to find a way to share revenue on the streams and other third party things that people do. Like if they aren't like, they're going to like realize that their content, like people want to see folks on streams. They want to see them here. They want to see them there. I think they'll find a way to monetize that. Even if they have their own channels and their own producers, I think they will. Uh, but I know that they are, there's no organization. I mean, their, their law firm is, is right here in, uh, in Pittsburgh. I think they're K and L Gates, uh, uh, K and L Gates. They're, uh, that's, uh, is one of their, is their firm. They're one of Gates, uh, Gates is that's Bill Gates's dad's firm. Uh, they're one of like the main, well, not a main client, but they're an important client that they have. And I, I think there was some aggressive stuff. Even, uh, there was talk even of the WB talking about gaining, ownership of people's real names after they leave the promotion like is there some like implied trademark Mm -hmm. in a person's real name if it's close enough to their trademark name some type of argument like that i don't know where that came from but like there's a there's this emphasis on complete control within the wwe yeah like i know as a writer when someone works for the wwe i can almost message them while they're there on twitter or an email Mm -hmm. and the day they leave is the day I interview them or like two or three days after literally like I shot one guy a text three years ago or something, a text, but a a DM Mm -hmm. and I get an answered message back like a week after he leaves, like, Oh, sorry, I didn't see this. I'm sure you did. You pinged me. Yeah. We, we, you know, that's cool. Uh, And then there was another time, like I, I, yeah, I did a thing with uh, Austin Aries for Mel uh, at one point, but it was literally like the week he had been cut mm-hmm. uh, or had left uh, WWE. And he talked a lot about like the wear and tear on his body and stuff. And it was, it was an interesting little story. Um, but I, this, I, I just don't see how those guys get out from under complete control. And I feel like if things are going well for them, mm-hmm those players are not going to shake the, uh, they're not going to shake the wagon. You know, they're not going to, they're not going to rock the boat. It's just a really hard thing to, to, you know, people were excited about AEW possibly doing more that way. Mm -hmm. But I I think the fact that they haven't speaks more to the fact that it would be incredibly hard to do within the sport. Mm 
within the structure of the sport. Uh, I know David Starr got a lot of mileage out of it. I think he got hit with a Me Too or something, and that kind of died out. But mm. there was like a Vice article about him doing it. Somebody had asked me to write about him at one point, and I said I just didn't think, you know, I mean, I support everybody trying to unionize and organize. And uh, I mean, I think that that's the best way to to improve your, uh, your working conditions. Mm. Uh, I mean, particularly if you're getting close to actually getting actually getting like recognized as as your unit your bargaining unit or or you know you're able to kind of get some concessions from your boss just from direct action but i can't think of a company that is you know sort of the top company i can't think of a company like the wbe that is that is a more cutthroat independent contractor driven company i mean it's like the model like like mm-hmm. uber couldn't be that that if it tried yeah you know it would if it could Every company would, would want to be that. I mean, it owns your likeness. It owns your it owns your results in the ring. It owns your time on the camera. It sets every bit of that. Mm-hmm. You know, even as bad as MMA is, because that would be hard to unionize too. Very hard to unionize. And the money is lower even. Like the revenue, the payouts to some of those guys. I, I know that ESPN periodically talks about how little they make mm-hmm. is, is pathetic. But at least you can, if you drag the other guy, you can get 15 minutes on the camera plus the interview. Right. You know, or like a bunch of replays if you knock him out in 30 seconds. Mm-hmm. Whereas in the WWE, you hit the time points they want mm-hmm. in the amount, like in the time they give you. Yeah. You do what they they do. Your your character, I mean, might be you, but it's shaped by writers. It's shaped by teams. Mm-hmm. Uh, it is such a strange environment. I mean, Jesse Ventura is right when he's like, these definitely are workers. I mean, no company exercises more control over the conditions of employment Mm -hmm. than the WWE. It's just for what, you know, I mean, McMahon's genius was that he sort of got this this sport that's almost like, it was already kind of built to be as labor unfriendly as it gets, mm-hmm. you know, spread out. I, I mean, it's about the most like union unfriendly, this thing, this side of, of selling drugs or something, something that's not part of a, a market, mm-hmm. not part of the like above ground economy. Mm-hmm. And he has, he has been able to build that into, uh, into something where that control is really what's at the heart of the WWE success, the control mm-hmm. of everything. The fact that nobody or almost nobody, like there'll be a few people like ESPN will get a quote from a WWE wrestler or, you know, Triple H on behalf of somebody or something. But I I can't think of a harder group of people to get information from. I can't think of a more tightly controlled. There's just, uh, you know, I I know Zelina is leaving and uh, there's a lot of potential ways she can make money. Well, I heard she makes more off OnlyFans than she did from the WWE. (laughs) And, you know, I joked uh, on the podcast I recorded about this, that if the WWE were willing to uh, give some ground there, they could probably partner with their male and female performers to get a cut of that or launch their own version if they, they are. weren't willing. Okay. They're, hiring, they're hiring a Twitch brand manager now. Yeah, so that's what's going. And that yeah. Twitch is going to go down like that. But I'm talking OnlyFans. Like if they launch that's their the, only. Yeah. That, yeah. I bet that's, I wouldn't, I don't want to say for sure, but I bet something like that, maybe a little more PG mm-hmm. is being considered because if you go and look at like, well, like, she was PG, her stuff was PG, her, her stuff was cosplay. Like, yeah. They can, they can do that. Like they, yeah. I'm sure that's going to be in the, I'm sure that's going to be in the works because you can go to a standard Instagram, like, uh, like Lana, for example. Mm-hmm. And that's like, that's basically like PG 13 yeah. right there. And she's able to operate that. And to me, that's, that's, that's the future of like WWE has got to have a, a vehicle for delivering that male and female, you know, right. like, like the nice body content. Um, I'm sure that it's, I'm sure that it's being debated and they, cause they, they're still trying to be family friendly at this. They're trying to do a lot of different things like yeah. athletic moves. Some fans want blood. WB is sort of holding the line more on that than AEW. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But they, they they got, they got to, they got to, I mean, with, with once that's done, the, like the, like the union concerns of, of Zelina Vega, those folks will get their cut. Mm-hmm. And because there aren't many of them, because they're like, they're nobody is really like, if my boss were as all powerful over my life, 
Mm. I would not be able to be on this pod. I would quit my job. Like I wouldn't be able to be on your podcast. I wouldn't be able to write a tweet without, I I would be really uh, beaten down. I mean, like I would have to, I mean, the paycheck would have to be really good for me Mm-hmm. to to consent to that so if if he gets that if WWE gets that straightened out and gets that revenue stream flowing kind of like the percentage of merch or whatever the guys get that that to me will resolve that but it is really crazy like yeah. it's a really crazy it's a really crazy and and kind of a sad problem like i, I would have set pro wrestling up a hundred years ago as a hiring hall in the union style like a trades union hiring hall that puts on its own events with registered train licensed wrestlers who can do this but you know that that never would have been able to promote as skillfully as mcmahon or paul Heyman or bill watts it would never be able to do it as flexibly uh or but it would be it would be much you know i mean like the guys could potentially have you know group insurance they could have benefits it would that that's how i would have done it and i'm amazed that it's because they were so spread out even then in the 30s 40s 50s mm-hmm. that like you couldn't you couldn't pull them together to pull this off and at yeah. the end of the day people even though millions watch wrestling and this is an interesting topic to it only a few people work in wrestling mm-hmm. right you know and mm-hmm. that's the that's the biggest concern so like andrew yang can say you know i'm going to come in and i'm going to i'm going to hit them hard if they put me in the biden administration and i'll reclassify pro wrestling but it's interesting to say he's done the same thing for mma but like if he was in a biden administration they'd have him working on something else mm-hmm. yeah you know what i mean like he if he's going to be secretary of labor there's bigger fish to fry and they would they would move on like that's not going to be and that's that's sort of the beauty of what vince mcmahon does it's even as the most powerful promoter, he's important enough to have a wife that was like a near cabinet official, mm-hmm. but he's also utterly unimportant, yeah. you know, Yeah. except for if he gets busted. Uh, I mean, he's already gotten through most of his scandals. So kind of like, like Trump before he got elected, McMahon has gone through most of his crazy scandals. So yeah, it's kind of in the clear on that, but it's an interesting thing. I mean, I think I, I, I would love to see like wrestler driven. I thought that's what AEW was going to be, but it's a corporate, it's a corporate model too. And mm-hmm. that they're, that, that's how they have to do it because of where the, how they, how they pay the bills basically. So. Yeah. yeah. Well, we could talk about it all night, but before I, before I let you go, I mean, I would love to talk about it all night, but <laughs> you've got a baby. Oh, to no, yeah, we both, uh, I think, you, yeah, you got a, yeah, you got a cat limits. that looks like it's kind of like waiting for something to do. It's a couple of them. Yeah. Uh, yeah I have one too. He was just, I, up see, on my, I saw him. I saw him. For yeah, her. No, it's a him. It's a him. Well, technically. Okay. It's kind of a her because he yeah. had uh, his penis yeah. taken off. Yeah. Of the surgery. Oh, Jesus. So, yeah. Yeah. It's a yeah. really crazy thing. <laughs> So yeah, yeah, they can be whatever they want to be. Yeah, I don't want to talk about cat surgeries. It costs a couple no. thousand dollars. It's a long story. But uh before we let you go, what are you working on? Like what are we what are we looking for next? Uh, a lot of good stuff. I mean, I've got a piece on the Beef Brothers comic coming out in Mel probably Friday, I think, depending on if I finish it tonight before I go to bed. Mm-hmm. I've got the Tracy Smothers obituary. That's actually coming out at Splice today rather than the Ringer. Uh, I've got some, we're going to be doing something on the body stuff with, uh, David Shoemaker at the ring or down the line. Um, uh, everybody, I encourage everybody to check out the what's left podcast. Cause we're going to have, uh, guests on, I mean, guests are on related to all kinds of things. It's mainly like a labor and politics, uh, type site, but we're, you know, we, we're going to have an MMA fighter on. I'm going to talk to him about the work of, of MMA. I'm going to have a pro wrestling trainer on, talk to him about that. So that's ongoing too. And, you know, probably every week, I, if you follow me on Twitter at Mustache Club US, I have a couple things coming out that, that, that you know, fans of this stuff would, would like. So appreciate you having me here, Chris. Awesome. Oliver, thanks so much, man. No problem. No problem. Thank and that you. brings another episode of Not About Wrestling to a close. Guests of the Not About Wrestling show stay in their own damn houses. If you like the show, please share it on social or leave a review on iTunes. And remember to subscribe to Not About Wrestling on YouTube. Just go to youtube.com backslash bro Bible and find the not about wrestling section. Thanks again for listening or watching and see you all next week. Well, I won't, I won't see you at all. You know what I mean. <laughs>